Hey guys and ladies, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a spring list for 2024. Now, I have to say that um, I wasn't going to do this at first, but uh, I'm seeing all these other YouTubers drop their spring lists, so uh, monkey see, monkey do, I guess. But we are going to do things a little bit different here at Channel Ram. Uh, we are going to do five niche, five designers, all of which are still available. So the five niche are still available. The five designers are still available. Then we're going to do five discontinued, we'll call them treasure hunt fragrances. You're going to have to go on a treasure hunt to find these. There's no doubt about it. These are not easy to find, although not all of them are super expensive. You're just going to have to do some digging, okay? And then we are going to do five of what I'm calling artisanal fragrances. So the Ensars, Aris Ladores, Bortnikoffs, Sultan Pasha's basically, okay? Um, five of those, all right? So it's going to be a top 20, which is uh, for what I've been doing with these uh, this year in perfume list. This is actually going to be pretty much a breeze for me. And um, so usually folks start with designer first, but I wanted to toot my own horn a little bit. So I'm going to cheat and I'm going to start with uh, niche tonight. And so again, this is spring 2024. Uh, these fragrances are just fragrances that I think about wearing for spring. Now, one thing I should mention is that I don't have any, like, list or I don't have a season I put my fragrances in. So that's where me and Rich Mitch kind of differ a little bit. He sticks everything into a season and you have to do what works for you. For me, I love just being able to reach and grab and wear whatever I want whenever I want. However, however, there's a big but with this. Uh, and that big but is that... I like to wear specific types of fragrances in certain seasons. So what you'll see in the spring list is you're going to see a lot of what um, I guess traditionalists would call a fougere. Okay, there are different types of fougere in here, but uh, there's a lot of fougere fragrances. There's also some barbershop fragrances. And um, for, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's the green aspect of the fern recreation that the, that the perfumers are trying to make. Um, and that kind of reminds me of the greenness of spring. I don't know whether it is because my father's signature scent is a green fragrance and I always associated it with spring. It's like one of the perfect spring fragrances it is on this list. Um, so basically, you know, you're going to find a lot of similar fragrances, but I don't consider them spring fragrances is where I'm going with this. Um, I don't consider these fragrances I'm going to show you only to be worn in spring is what I'm trying to say. So basically you can wear them in winter, you can wear them in summer, you can wear them in fall. But um, when I, when spring comes around, these are kind of the fragrances that start popping into my head to be worn. Okay, so enough of that. Let's um, get to the first perfume, which is going to be, I did say I wanted to give myself a little bit of a shout out, and I'm going to do a shameless plug here, okay? And said shameless plug is for an amouage. And um, I just reviewed it today, actually. It's even my scent of the day. So uh, number one on this list, oh, by the way, um, one thing I should mention is that this is completely unranked. So even though we're gonna go one through 20, uh, one is not better than 20, 20 is not better than one. In my mind, this is just a spring list. Talk about a bunch of fragrances, just a cool way to talk about a lot of different fragrances. Um, so number one on the list is Amouage Beloved Man. And as I said, um, there is a review of this today uh, on my channel. This is my scent of the day. So if you want a full in-depth review of Beloved Man, you can check this out. But basic, basically, this is a very, um, very nice, very uh, attractive, very posh, very elegant, sort of woody, spicy fragrance that has an amazing citrus top that blends into the heart and amazing powdery iris. Uh, LME, just fantastic little hints of Amouage's backbone here, but in a very smooth and rounded way, okay? Uh, I said, imagine, in the review I mentioned saying something along the lines of, imagine like water or sand sanding down like a stone over the millennia, and it just turning completely smooth. That is Beloved Man. It is so smooth and elegant and posh. Great uh, for spring because as the weather heats up, many people don't think about Amouage as a brand for the warmer weather, but they have some good ones in here. Um, they're not all... Interlude Man, for example, they have some fragrances that I would consider spring and summer ready. Beloved Man is one. So go check out my full review if you would like to sort of hear my in-depth thoughts, half an hour of me rambling on Beloved Man. And I really, really enjoyed wearing that today. Really enjoyed it. Um, so Beloved Man from 2013, created by 
Alexandra Carlin is number one. Number two uh, is a Frederick Mall, and it is a Jean-Claude Elena creation, and in his name you're going to see over and over and over again. I think Jean-Claude Elena uh, is almost like tailor-made for spring. Like the way he does his fragrances, the way that, um, you know, they're put together with his watercolor style and all that stuff, his fragrances are perfect for spring and summer, in my opinion. Um, this one has really grown on me. In fact, there was so much shit talked about this fragrance when I bought it that I was almost a little scared because I blind bought it. Um, but um, I um, have, have fa absolutely fallen in love with it more than my greatest expectation just because of some of the things that were said about it. I was expecting it to be, eh, in fact, it's fantastic. Maybe one of the greatest uses of geranium ever. Um, and this is called Rose and Queer. And you notice it doesn't say geranium and queer. It says rose and queer. Uh, and so this is where Jean-Claude Elena works a little bit of his magic. There's two types of geranium in here, bourbon geranium and geranium. Um, I can't profess to know what the differences are between them. I am not a perfumer, but um, it does have a isobutyl quinoline note, which is IBQ, that leather note you're probably very familiar with. Um, and there's a fruity black currant in here, Nepalese Sichuan pepper, which usually gives like a fiery aspect. Um, and vetiver and cedarwood, tailor-made for spring, very floral. The um, geranium in here comes across, along with the vetiver, those two notes come across as very, very green. The um, geranium can be peppery, spicy smelling. The Sichuan pepper can be peppery and spicy smelling. So you get this spicy, peppery geranium, which has rosy aspects, but um, uh, it is very light but for a fragrance that is so light the damn thing lasts forever i mean it is a monster on my skin i have no problem smelling it all day but it's not a you know it's not like wearing the the night or the moon or promise or anything like that it, it lasts a long time but it does it in a lighter elegant fashion that's why i think it's perfect you know it has that jean-claude elena watercolors and his name is going to come up over and over and over again in this video uh, i've really come around to his work especially for situational perfume like if you're trying to wear something for spring let's say this is absolutely perfect so rose and queer uh someone told me a rumor about this fragrance the other day they said it was originally supposed to be rose oud and queer and then frederick mall said no we're not going to do that or maybe jean-claude elena didn't want to use the oud note and so he just did rose and queer and, and i absolutely love it for what it is so rose and queer uh number two on spring 2024 list number three is a creed and what's interesting about this creed is it is a creed that features the note of tobacco. Now, most people don't think about tobacco when you think about spring. Okay, most people think about tobacco in fall and winter. But this is what makes creed so unique is that creed makes these very fresh, uplifting, effervescent, easy to wear, citrusy scents, right? Uh, and this is a Pierre Bourdon creation from my understanding. This is called uh, Tabarome Millicime. By the house of creed so this is a vintage bottle so i cannot profess to know what the new batch smells like i think this is a 20 uh 14 i think this is a 2014 uh, if i'm not mistaken but uh, so it's like a decade old okay but um this is one of the most unique tobacco fragrances i think i've ever smelled because it's fresh tobacco you know at first the tobacco smells very green almost uh and it's mixed with notes like tea which he Pierre Bourdon, when I say he is a little bit of an expert at using tea, he used it to perfection in silver mountain water. It's also mixed with black currant, okay? Uh, and there's a coffee and rum note apparently listed here, but I don't get very much coffee or rum, I must confess. Um, I don't get much coffee and rum, but I do get a ton of ginger. A little bit of grapefruit, citruses, probably some bergamot, other things in the top in here with that creed pink pepper, you know, that rosy peppery smell which is very sometimes it can be associated with designers but creed uses it very well to be um very likable you know creed's fragrances are just very likable it's one of the reasons why i think a lot of people when they first come to the uh niche side of things creed is one of their first stops because it's just so easy to wear and uh, the tobacco in the base mixes with that creamy um Creed sandalwood that probably has that sparkly salty ambrox and ambergris in the base and so even though this is spicy even though it's woody uh, even though it's slightly even smoky 
um, because of the tobacco. It does dry to a very fine tobacco. So it starts out very green, dries very fine and brown, almost like finely sliced tobacco. Um, and that transition is very interesting, but it stays fresh the whole time. You get lots of that fresh, you know, ginger adds that like zing, right? Um, not like the perfume zing, but like zing, you know, like a, um, like a palate cleansing ginger, right? And it sort of keeps the fragrance smelling so fresh and effervescent, bubbly. Um, I mean, I've never smelled anything like this, ever. Uh, I never smelled a fragrance like this since I've smelled this, and I never smelled a fragrance like this before. This is very unique to me. Uh, one of the more unique creeds that doesn't get much talk, Tabarome Millicime. I think it's perfect for spraying, personally, um, at number. And by the way, this is my second bottle. I wish I would have kept the first bottle. But um, this is my second bottle. I actually ran through an entire 50 or 75 mil. These were 75. This is my second 75 mil. So um, I have a lot of experience with this scent. Tabarome Millicime at number three. Number four. Uh, number four is a L'Artisan. And I think it's the fragrance that influenced um, Terre de Hermes, which is a Jean-Claude Elena masterpiece. So if you like Terre, you'll like Timbuktu, in my opinion. Um, and so since I just said it, it is Timbuktu. Uh, and Timbuktu is a Bertrand du Chafour, and he was really creating, uh, he was really playing with this overdose of sort of isoe super, uh, that cedar, vetiver, dry down. If you're familiar with Terre, you'll, you'll pick up similarities with Timbuktu. But this mixes, the reason why I think this is perfect for spring, and, and Terre is also perfect for spring, um, but the reason I picked this one is that Timbuktu houses this green mango note that Bertrand du Chafour played with in a couple of his fragrances. And that green mango, you know, in India, people drink green mango as like a palate cleanser, like, like not a palate cleanser, but like to cool down from the heat. You know, it's supposed to have this cooling property, green, fresh mango. And you get that in here. Um, there's other interesting notes. The frankincense and papyrus are very interesting. They keep Timbuktu very interesting to me. Um, there is a little bit of myrrh and benzoin in the base, but the, the vetiver and the big dose of ISOE makes it feel airy and easy to wear for spring. I would have no problem wearing this in uh, spring. And, and even the um, sort of uh, vintage version, a lot of people give this a hard time because they're like, the new one doesn't last. Honestly, this one didn't last very long. I mean, this is like six to eight hours max. Usually by six hours, I'm ready to reapply. Um, but that green mango with that very interesting vetiver. Vetiver's another note which comes up for me in spring. When springtime rolls around, vetiver's the type of, I, I really start thinking about vetiver heavy scents. This is one, you're going to see another one, actually a couple more coming up here very soon. Um, something about the green grass coming out in, in spring, it's crazy because one, it seems like one day the grass is brown, next day you look, the damn thing's green. Um, and, and so that, that transition to green really makes me want to wear my vetiver. So Timbuktu from Latizan at number four. Number five is Erosia. And actually, I, I picked this on purpose because I said everything was going to be still available. This one, there's a little bit of a hitch because this particular bottle is discontinued. This is Oligarch by, by Roja. And many people say this is Roja's take on Terre de Hermes, which... And, and as I just said, I think Terre was heavily inspired by Timbuktu. So there you go, like a niche, like a niche version of a niche. Um, so good luck trying to wrap your head around that one. But um, Oligarch is discontinued. They have since re-released it, though. The brand says that there is no difference. Um, the name has just changed. And the reason they changed it is because Oligarch offended somebody, uh, which I'm not a fan of, of uh, bowing down to the mob of... I'm offended, so you have to discontinue it for me because I'm one person, blah, like, fuck you. You know what I mean? Um, but they did this, discontinue this, uh, and um, they released it under a name, which I think is just stupid, which is Isola Blue. They've since now released Isola Soul, and I'm like, oh, what is the brand doing? I, I, don't, I don't know where Roja is going. I feel like Roja is starting to kind of do the M. Wash thing where they're going in a category that I can't follow, but this is great. I mean, um, this is basically a fruity sheepra, but it has lots of elements of tear, okay? It just does. You can't get around it. You know, that uh, grassy green vetiver dry down will remind you of tear, but there is more going on here, especially in the opening. You get lots of limes and lemons and bergamots, thyme, lavender, and a lot of fruits. So you get apple, coconut, 
black current, which seems to be the trend so far in the first couple, uh, the, the niche side anyways, lots of scents have black current in it, I just noticed, um, which I mean, fruity black current, no, makes a lot of sense, but black current, strawberry, um, uh, did I say apple, lots of fruits in here in the top with, um, an ambergris, Roja claims to use real ambergris, I don't know, this is the eau de parfum version, um, I think there was a parfum version of Oligarch for a little bit, and then that got discontinued maybe like instantly, you know, it came out and got instantly discontinued, um, and so yes, I mean, if, um, if you want this, you can still get it, you just have to go to Isola Blue, which I don't think the marketing really matches the smell to me, if the smell is exactly like this, I don't think the marketing matches the smell, but I do really like this, so, um, Oligarch at number five, okay. The next five are going to be five designers that are still readily available. Now, that being said, you're going to see some bottles here that are a little bit older, okay? So the bottle you can buy like right now may be a little different from the one I'm going to show you, but all the scents are still available. If you want to go on a vintage hunt, you can, but all of these are still available. You can just click buy from the company, okay? The first one is, speaking of vetiver what I would consider to be the greatest vetiver fragrance of all time. This is like spring vetiver for me. There's something about just the way the green, you know, um, grassy vetiver in here mixes with the citruses and then dries down to that very manly tobacco. I heard this described as like a working man's tobacco. You know, like they go home, uh, their hands are all greasy from actually working with their hands today. You know, for example, I just sit in front of a computer all day. Um, so my hands aren't necessarily getting greasy, but there is a lot of men out there who are still working with their hands, let's say, in one job or another. But back in the day, that was even more prevalent. And so this tobacco dry down gives this working man's feel. And this is called Guerlain's Vetiver, of course, um, from 1959. I heard someone say, no, nah, it's not 59, it's 61, but Parfumo says 59, so I'm going with 59. Uh, green, spicy, uh, apparently, rumor is um, that this was supposed to be a scent made for South America, okay? So, uh, Guerlain wanted to make a scent for South America, and they kind of gave it to Jean-Paul Guerlain. He was a very young man in 1959. He was trying to prove himself, you know, like a rookie in the league, trying to make a name for himself, and, uh, apparently he took that project, which was supposed to be, like, regionalized, and just absolutely killed it, and Vetiver became one of the best, uh, actually, I would consider this one of the greatest masculines ever created, ever. Now, many people will say, yeah, but Carvin Vetiver had a scent, and there was all these Vetivers coming out at that time, and that's fine, but for me, this is mine. You know, this is the one that I relate to. Just the way the Vetiver, I mean, with that posh Guerlain, but, you know, the grassy pepperiness, which the pepper, by the way, and the spiciness is actually turned up in Vetiver Extreme. Like, if you like that pepperiness, Try Vetiver Extreme by Guerlain, which I um, um, I feel like they were kind of trying to keep up with Frederick Mall's Vetiver Extraordinaire. It's 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 like you know, move, counter, next house moves, next house tries to counter it. You know, there's all this back and forth when you really look at fragrance history. It's very interesting, uh, at least to a fragrance nerd like me. But uh, I I I mean I don't know what to say any more about this than what probably what has been said. I'm gonna try to review it one of these days. I'll probably just stumble all over myself and blabber like a complete idiot uh, and just drool all over the blotter, uh, it, but it's it's amazing. I mean, the vetiver, and the good news is you can just still go buy it right now for whatever it is. Apparently, Guerlain keeps it in fantastic condition, so yes, the, um, the advertisement, the old advertisement is perfect. It shows like a forest, you're, like you're almost in a plane looking down on a forest, so you see the tops of the trees, and a man what almost looks like sailing, but on top of the forest, okay? So he's got his sailboat, and, and you know, you can, you can almost see, like, the trail of the water behind him blurring the trees down below, but there is no water. He's sailing on top of the forest. Perfect uh, representation of the vintage vetiver. Um, I, I love it. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge, like I said, huge, huge fan, especially around this time of year. I have a second bottle. Um, and so this one's the Eau de Toilette. This particular bottle is not anymore, but you, like I said, you can still buy the scent. But I also have the Eau de Cologne. Uh, and the Eau de Cologne and the Eau de Toilette are a little bit different. Um, 
you know, maybe one day I'll just do a comparison video instead of trying to review it, but they're both very, very close. That's the thing. There are differences, but they're both very close. So I would just say if you want to spend like a hundred bucks or something and just go down to the store and just buy something for a hundred dollars and not have to think about reformulations, you cannot go wrong with uh, Guerlain's Vetiver. Okay. Now I mentioned this in the intro. Um, and this one is called Paco Rabanne Pour Homme, one of the greatest fougeres ever created, this green, spicy fougere with lots of oily, um, herbal rosemary, uh, with clary sage, rosewood, which is one of my favorite notes. Rosewood gives off this, um, uh, sort of citric side to the wood as well, citrusy and deep and woody and um, geranium and lavender, tonka bean, oak moss, musk, honey, and amber. And there's almost like this, um, uh, what would you say? Like um, fruit conserve like smell in Paco Rabanne Pour Homme. Like, it, like the honey aspect gives this old school kind of fruit conserve, but it just feels so outdoorsy, so fresh, very similar to vetiver in the sense that they both remind me of just being in the outdoors, being around nature, being with, um, being around trees and fresh cut grass and flowers that are in bloom. And I mean, for me, this is like, this is the scent of a man because this is literally what my father has smelled like for my entire 38 year life, um, soon to be 39 year life. So this is his signature scent. I've got multiple bottles of this stuff. Never want to be without it. Uh, just this, just spraying this. I mean, if I wear this, I literally get images of going to the zoo as a kid or going to the park or, I mean, all the stuff where you would just catch a whiff of your dad after he shaved or something like that. Special fragrance, but perfect for spring for me from 1973, Paco Rabanne Pour Homme, an instant classic. Okay. Now we're going to jump to 1992, but 1992 on this one's a little bit of a misnomer. And the reason is, in the 70s is when this fragrance actually came out. Um, and it was titled Loewe para Hombre. They since changed it to Loewe por Um, And the para Hombres are impossible to find. Rich Mitch has a bottle or two. I would love a bottle of the para Hombre. However, he does say that this is still very, very good. Um, and so this is Loewe por Homme. Now, I'm going to say the same thing I said about the other one. The bottle looks different now, but uh, you can still buy this. And um, it's lemon, basil, lavender, clean, lab, beautiful, fresh, citrusy lavender uh, with Sicilian mandarin orange, uh, geranium, lily of the valley, oak moss, Haitian vetiver, musk, sandalwood, and amber. Uh, Marcel Carls is credited as the perfumer of, the, of this version, okay? <laughs> I don't know if the Pata Hombre is different. Yeah, Pata Hombre came out in 74, and it's also listed as... Um, Marcel Carl. So I'm guessing they just gave him credit for all of them, even if this has been reformulated. Um, and, you know, they're much more specific, let's say, in the Pata Hombre version. It's not bergamot, it's Calabrian bergamot. Well, actually, there's no bergamot in this one, so there's a difference right there. Uh, it's not lemon, it's uh, Sicilian lemon. It's not lavender, it's French lavender. You get where I'm going with that. So, uh, much more specific. Many people compare this to like YSL Pour Homme from 72, something along those lines. Uh, it was probably heavily influenced by YSL Pour Homme, 71, excuse me. Well, YSL Pour Homme was 71. Um, so it was definitely probably influenced by it, especially since it only came out a couple years later. Uh, and I mean, YSL Pour Homme could also be on this list. Anything with that heavy citric backbone, which the lemon here is perfect for that. So, uh, Rich Mitch, I once heard say, I've never smelled such a lemon. Spot on. I mean, it is an amazing citricky, citrus lemon scent. And uh, those old school masculines fit perfectly into spring for me because of the heavy citruses. Okay, next on the list, we have a barbershop fragrance, which, again, still around. You can still buy it. I, I don't know what the current formulation is like. It may not smell like the vintage that I have here, but it's still probably... 99% better than the shit that comes out nowadays, and this is Azaro Pour Homme. So a barbershop classic, James Bond, through and through, spicy, woody, uh, lavender with that anise. Oh, man. Yeah, there's, you know, even though this, the anise, some people may say, ah, but the anise is too sharp for spring. I disagree. I think there's something about that shaving foam barbershop fougere here 
that fits perfectly. Um, and the anise is just one part of that. And, and it became very popular to put out fragrances with anise. And again, Gerard Anthony Masterstroke. It is also listed to Martine Heiden, Heidenreich and uh, Richard Wirtz, but Gerard Anthony is what I would consider the um, the uh, headline name there. And of course, it dries down to that leathery Tonka. It's it's a fougere, so you're going to get the Kumar and Tonka thing, uh, but it also dries down slightly leathery with the oak moss, which I love, and the, the shaving foam aspect. Beautiful, uh, beautiful, uh, spicy, woody fougere at number... Nine, number 10. Now, number 10 is a little bit of a, I had to do a little bit of a, a quick draw switch. And the reason is, is because I was originally going to include this, Equipage Geranium, uh, which again, Jean-Claude Elena. Uh, so you get a little bit of a bonus in this one. But when I pulled it up on Parfumo, it has officially been discontinued which this being discontinued and um, Bellamy Vetiver being discontinued absolutely break my heart. Honestly, I think they're two of the best flankers ever, 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 ever of all time, especially uh, Bellamy Vetiver. The fact that Hermes discontinued those is like eh, one of the biggest choke jobs I think I've ever encountered. Like, what are you doing, Hermes? Um, meanwhile, they're releasing these, uh, you know, uh, impossible to find, limited edition, available for one month only, act now. Don't let future regret play a role. Like, come on. Um, quick, spend your 500 bucks. You're just lucky to even get a chance to smell this fragrance. You're lucky to even own it, sir. And it's like, I'm not playing that game. Um, what's, what's, what's the name of that, Hermes? Uh, it is, I'll tell you. I will tell you. Paddock? Ooh, it's not even listed on here. Hermes Paddock? I, I, I can't remember. It's something like that. It's something like Paddock. Um, but yes, so that's what they're doing, unfortunately. Um, and so when I saw that was discontinued, I'm like, I'm not going to include that because these are supposed to be available designers. You could probably still find Equipage Geranium, but I'm not going to include it. So we did an Audible. And the Audible goes to something that is still available. Uh, according to Parfumo, anyways, uh, I don't know in what form it's still available, but um, this is Monsieur de Givenchy. Now, like I said with Loewe de Poron, I like fragrances that are fresh and citrusy for this time of year. This fits that perfect, but very old school. Old school carnation, old school lavender, very austere fragrance. You know, this is like one of those fragrance for men who are like, I don't wear perfume, I'm a man. Uh, this is 1959, remember. So, um, same year as, as Vetiver. And, um, but there is a very interesting, fresh, uh, slightly floral, lemon, vervain thing going on. Uh, but oak moss, musk, sandalwood, very to the point. You know, I think about, like, um, who is it, Bart Starr's, like, up and down, like, uh, you know, army haircut. Uh, and so, yes, there's, there's definitely something militaristic about this. But I really like it. It's very classy masculine. Um, there is one thing, though, I will tell you. If you are one of those vintage hunters, and if you're like, I don't care if it's still available, no way in hell am I buying the modern formulation. That would be me. Uh, and, you, and you want to hunt down the version I think is even better, more to my taste, because this is very fresh and light and citrusy, and it really does kind of go away. Three, four hours in, I'm ready to reapply, okay? But if you want one of this style, but same notes, but done in a heavier, concentrated fashion um go for this little bad boy right here and this is monsieur de givenchy haut concentration so um yes you're gonna have to do some hunting on this one so this is like a preview of the ones to come but um man this is so much better so much thicker and richer and heavier same sort of dna i mean look at the juice color difference so yes um monsieur de givenchy is the fifth designer uh, that we have on the list for spring. Okay, now we're going to go to five discontinued fragrances, which I'm going to make you hunt for. Some of them are out-and-out out unicorns. You're going to have to pay big money for a period. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. Some of them, actually, uh, I may have talked about on the channel, but very briefly, 
And so we're going to give some love to some fragrances that don't get love usually. So you may still find some of these floating around at a fair price. The first one, actually, I'm going to get a blotter because I want to smell this. So Uno Momento. Don't go anywhere. It's been a little bit since I have um, sniffed the old Turbo. And that's literally what this is. So at number 11, we have a Fabergé fragrance that's discontinued, and it's called Turbo. Almost like you're going to put a turbo sauce in your engine uh, to clean to clean it out, right? There's this, um, there's, uh, the, the advertisement says, Turn It On, Turbo by Fabergé, a very new fragrance for men. It's supercharged, and it's like a man standing by a sports car with a woman, of course, waiting to get into the car with him. The good old days. Um... And this is, again, perfect for spring because this is a fougere. You guessed it. It is a fougere. It is an out-and-out out vintage spicy green fougere. And it also uses a little hint of what um, Azaro made so popular, what uh, Gerard Anthony just ran away with, with um, Azaro, but Turbo uses heavier spice. So you get a little bit of cumin, a little bit of clove, again, just a little bit, a little bit of marjoram. Uh, the base apparently is real ambergris, which is 1982, remember, this is 1982. Um, but there's something so classically sort of set about this, you know, there's for all of its, um, all of its uh, advertisements and strutting, you know, peacock strutting around, it's turbocharged, it's supercharged. It really doesn't smell like that. It smells very classically, other than the very strange bottle. Um, other than the very, I was just reading that disclosure right there, which is pretty funny. I don't know if you can make that out. Um, but other than the very strange bottle, Fabergé Inc., New York, New York, made in the USA. Do we even make anything in the USA anymore? Um, yeah, I mean, other than the very strange bottle and advertisement, like the juice inside doesn't match up with the advertisement. This is a very dressed up. Actually, maybe it does because in the advertisement, the guy's wearing a, a suit. So he's not just dressed like me in jeans and a polo. He's actually wearing a suit. His his woman, which is going to get in the car, is wearing like an evening gown and, um, you know, like a mink around her. So maybe the people are actually photorealistic of the scent, even if the ridiculous advertisement is not. But Turbo by Fabergé. And I reviewed a Fabergé called, Ch I think it was called Cellini. Cellini? Cellini? I can't remember. Um... But there is a Fabergé playlist, even though I only reviewed one. But Turbo is going to be on it very soon. Uh, and there's something reminiscent of Cellini in here. Very, uh, I remember, I remember Cellini. I keep saying that. And now I got, now I have to know what the hell it actually is. Maybe I'm saying it wrong, since it's been a while. When you have so many fragrances, you talk about, it. yeah, it is. It's it's Cellini. Um, and and I reviewed our. I think I reviewed the Eau de Toilette, if I'm not mistaken. That came out in 1980. This came out in '82. There's something that really reminded me of Cellini here. Um, Cellini's tagline was the first really new men's fragrance since Brute, because Brute was such a huge hit. And I don't think Cellini did that well, to be honest with you. Um, because they came out with Turbo, which smelled very... It actually, you know what? It smells like a turbocharged version of Cellini. That's a great way to describe it. Yeah, I could see that. 100%. I need a vintage bottle of Brut one of these days. I just I just need it for the collection. It's ridiculous. I don't have one. Uh, okay, so that's Fabergé's Turbo from 1982. Discontinued. You're going to have to hunt. Next discontinued fragrance you're going to have to hunt for. But I think Anouge at Enchanté has some, so you may not have to hunt that far. I am in love with this scent, by the way. This was like one of the finds of last year for me. Uh, and this is 12 by Jean Coutier. Um, and this apparently was, and this is an old tester, uh, Anuj very kindly sent me. This, uh, is basically a aromatic fougere 
Huh? I mean, I'm consistent. If anything, I'm consistent. This is the kind of stuff I want to reach for. But this one, um, this one I gave me some pause. The reason it gave me some pause is there is a pretty dirty animalic musk in the base and leather. And so even though it is a fougere, an aromatic fougere, uh, lots of like geranium and lavender and spices and this green, you know, God, what an aromatic fougere this is. This is so my speed. Like this is more my speed than turbo because there's something so rough and tumble. I would bet there's some animalic notes in here, even though it's just this musk. I would bet there's something. And it, it's already, I'm getting hints of that warm amber in the base. But what gets me is the dirty leather. That dirty, and it's probably the castorium. That's probably the animalic bit to create that leather. You know, vintage castorium is on another level. I don't have to tell you that. If you've been following the channel, you know. Um, musk, leather, amber, tarragon, geranium, lavender, that leather note, which probably is made up of castorium. It's probably where I'm getting that dirty animalic bit. This is so good. I mean, I was dumbfounded. When I smelled this for the first time, I was like, how? How is it 2023? And I've not smelled this yet. Like, I almost wanted to slap myself. Um... So yes, number 12, or just 12 by Jean Coutier. I love this stuff. And so the reason I was hesitant was because of that hard leather note. But it's a fougere. It fits. It's 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 probably one of the more ballsy on the discontinued list, okay? But fuck, it's so good. I need to review that. I mean, that deserves a, a vintage Hall of Fame review. It is phenomenal. Phenomenal. I can't say phenomenal enough. It is phenomenal. Okay. So next on the list, we have um, number 13. Now, number 13 is probably more traditionally a scent that I would associate with spring. Um, if you've ever smelled Caesar's Man uh, or Caesar's Legendary Cologne or whatever the hell they call it, this is in the same ballpark, but this is a Pierre Bourdon. So I think it's almost a little bit classier. And anything in the 80s from this house is a buy. That's the way I'm going to describe it. Literally anything from the 80s or early 90s, buy is a buy. If you're a vintage lover, you don't even have to think. If it's from the early 80s, buy. Uh, and this is called Jill Sander Man 3. So Jill Sander Man 3 is, um, again, a dihydromersinol bomb. Uh, it is, see here, I'm not getting as much dihydromersinol right out of the gate as I do on my skin. Here I'm getting more of the fruits right out of the gate. With that, you know, almost like a rooty artemisia and oily rosemary. But it will give you Dracar Noir vibes. It's going to be in the same category as Dracar Noir, Caesar's Man. You know, it's, it's in that category. But imagine Pierre Bourdon does it. And so some things are amped up a little bit. The fruits are amped up a little bit. Um, maybe the rose is amped up a little bit even. Or maybe that's a carnation. Maybe it's a combo. Rose and carnation. Patchouli, musk, oak moss, cedarwood, sandalwood, frankincense. And yeah, I mean, spicy, fresh, green, extra green. I mean, look at that. It's green. Um, perfect for this time of year. Just a beautiful, a beautiful fougere. Um, lots of classy lavender. This is good. Very good. Very, very good. Um, okay. I don't know why I'm spraying all of these hard to find ones all of a sudden, but uh, I am. Uh, okay, so next on the list, we have number 14. Number 14 is um, a fragrance that I took a chance on. If you've been following my channel, you remember I put out a unboxing video maybe like a year ago. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe it was like 15 months ago. I can't remember exactly, but a year to 15 months ago. Uh, and it was from Houston. And when I went in Houston, my good friend Duncan gave me a tip. He said, dude... Go to this fragrance shop. They still have some old vintages in there. I found this in there. And um, I got it for a pretty good price. Uh, it is Scott McClintock for men. 
And this fragrance is by Sarah, uh, sorry, Jessica McClintock is the, is the brand owner. Um, Scott McClintock for Men Cologne Spray by Jessica McClintock. And um, this is a crazy fragrance because it has a note of hard cider in it, okay? So it's a liquor, but it's almost like a... The opening is like glue. <laughs> it's like glue and hard cider. Like imagine you put literal glue inside of a glass, filled it up with hard cider, and um, put these um, energetic citrus notes in there with this animalic musky civet undertone, all right? But the hard cider and the spices in the very nice sandalwood, for whatever the hell this is, uh, the sandalwood in here is fantastic quality. I wouldn't be surprised if it's my soul. I mean, it's so... See, the fragrance is light enough to where you can pick out the quality sandalwood. Sometimes sandalwood gets lost in the shuffle, but... It dries down to a musk moss and vanilla. There is an amber vanilla quality, so there is some heft to this, but it's not heavy enough to make this like a winter. Like, um, you could wear this in winter, but this is probably better made for like a Texas winter, where we'll just get that random like 60 degree day in the middle of winter, you know, like a spring day, but it's actually January. That This, this would be perfect for that. But where in most places, that's a spring day, right? Um, there is a strange powdery aspect. I don't know what that's from. I have no clue what that powdery aspect is from. But the citrus notes are beautiful in here. It wears... Um, I don't know how it wears. I don't know what to just... I don't know what to compare this to is the thing. I'm sure there is a comparison. I just can't think of it. I mean, it came out in 1992. It's just a strange bird. But I really like it. I really like that strange hard cider. I don't think I've ever come across a fragrance with a hard cider note and done so well. Again, discontinued. You're going to have to hunt. Um, but it's good. Very good. Very, very good. Uh, okay, so that leaves just one. And we had to end on a bang. Um, <laughs> so you're going to have to spend some dough. If you don't have this and you're like, screw it, I'm just going to go buy maybe the rarest of the bunch I'm going to show. This is it. Uh, this is also maybe one of the greatest... Uh, Dunhill fragrances. Actually, I'm going to take maybe out of that sentence. This is the great. This is one of the greatest uh, Dunhill fragrances, and this is called Dunhill Blend 30. And you can see that dark green. It almost reminds you of forest green, right? Uh, Dunhill is a, you guessed it, Fougere. It's got the lavender. It's got the tonka bean, but it has this smoky hay-like dry down, okay? So it has this smoky hay-like dry down, and um, almost like tobacco dry down, right? This is also maybe the more, maybe the more challenging of the ones to wear in spring from the discontinued. These, these two, 12 and um, Dunhill Blend 30, for sure. This is a 250 ml bottle. I never want to be without this stuff. Um, Dunhill Blend 30 is a spicy, smoky fougere is, is the way to describe it. It's got that old school spicy carnation, which smells so green here now that I'm smelling it. I'm getting a lot of the green aspects of the neroli, the carnation. Carnation can sometimes come across as green, like chopped up leaves and grass green, right? That's kind of what, like, you're, like you took the stem of the carnation and just put it in the blender. But it's so spicy and there's such a heft, you know, the, the base is hefty with that dry hay tobacco. Fuck, man. I mean, how do you improve on this? This is by, uh, uh, I can't even speak. Somebody give me some words. Um, it's good. Okay. It's good. Very good. Is it worth $500 for a 250 mil bottle? Yes. Yes, it is. Um, yes, it is. If that's what these are going for, yes, it is. This may be going for $1,000. Fuck, I have no clue. But um, yes, this, uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a proper collection piece. I do not want to be without. So Dunhill Blend 30 is the number 15. Okay, so now we're going to go to the artisanal houses. 
okay? Uh, and number 16, we're going to start off, I'm starting off with the low-hanging fruit. Started off with Beloved Man, because I reviewed the damn thing today. And within the last couple months, I reviewed this, so I am really kind of plugging my channel. Uh, but go watch my review if you're new here. And um, this is called Fortnikoff's Amber Cologne. Amber Cologne just... Um, the thing about Amber Cologne and me is we have a very... Uh, we have sort of this uh, relationship where Amber Cologne and I give and take from each other. Because for me, Amber Cologne... I wear Amber Cologne on certain holidays religiously. I've worn this as my birthday scent years in a row. Uh, I've worn this as Father's Day scent years previously. Uh, and, and so Amber Cologne and me, you know, this time of year, April, May, June, gets a lot of wears. March, April, May, June gets a lot of wears. Uh, and, and I think it's probably the best from the Amber line. And... Um, Probably, you know, depending on how deep you are into the artisanal game, if you're new to Bortnikoff, Arige, and Sars, this will probably be the best ambergris fragrance you've smelled. Now, there are better, but this is probably one of the best for the money. And these amber, since they are amp, since they're cologne, or they're actually eau de parfums, but they're marketed as colognes, um, they are a little bit cheaper than the average Bortnikoff. So if you want to get like an in-depth review of Amber Cologne, go, go watch my review. But man, that frangipani opening, fuck, with that uh, ambergris dry down, brown and white ambergris, or, or gray and brown ambergris, I should say, it sparkles. I mean, this stuff sparkles, it's classy, it's different, it's unique, it's... It, it, it does the job. Number 16, Amber Cologne. Number 17 is an Ensar. So now we're really digging into the, you've got some dough to spend, okay? Um, I would I would like a bottle of this. I would not go out and pay what it's what it's being sold for, though. If you gave it to me, I would wear the piss out of this. But this is called Ensar Oud's Oud Yusuf. Now, Oud Yusuf is, um, actually, you know what? You're going to go on skin, Oud Yusuf. Um... Oud Yusuf is uh, basically a fruity, floral take on, on an oud. God, I mean, instantly you get that almost like, almost like nectarine dipped in syrup-like smell. And the thing about this is, so if you go to um, Parfumo and you just pull it up, it has one note, Thai oud. And I did a video and I was like, I can't believe that this oud that I'm smelling is just Thai Oud. Like these notes and accords and everything is so prominent. And someone came on and said, hey, I work for Ensar. You know, they left a comment on that video. You can go check it out. And they were like, actually in the in the pure parfum version, the sprayable perfume, there are other notes added to accentuate the notes of the regular Oud. Uh, but but if you if you just swipe the regular Oud, he was saying many of the notes that you're getting, the florals, the fruits, um, you get from just the oud. But you're not just spraying the, the, it's not just oud and alcohol. It's not like the history of oud collection from Marie Zodori. I said, okay, thank you for clarifying that. But I did a video on it. Um, if you would like to check it out, be my guest. Uh, oud Yusuf is apparently one of the, um, oud Yusuf is like one of the legendary Ensar oud distillations because of the, he calls it a flawless execution, orchestration of notes. And you know what? As I've grown in the Oud game, um, I uh, have come to appreciate stuff like this more. Like, if you watch my early Oud videos, I'm like, nope, I want my barnyard fecal animalic Oud. I don't want any of this shit. I don't want any of this floral, fruity Ouds. But now that I've come to appreciate them more, you know, like he says, there's hints of vanilla, a touch of rose, hints of orris butter, violet leaf in here, um, sumptuous florals, lilac smells, and lilies, and for an oud, pretty damn impressive. Is it my thing? No. I mean, uh, I, still it's not, even though I can, I can, I'm at the stage now where I can appreciate this much more. Subtle hints of honeydew melon and apricot. I definitely get the apricot. Definitely. Um, this like 
apricot, peaches and cream like smell. He says it's perhaps the prettiest oud you can wear. It is. I mean, it's very pretty. Um, subtler than the finest Borneo berried craze. Yeah, there's definitely a berry. Berries and cream, peaches and cream, apricot and cream, whatever you want to call it. But florals as well. Purple smelling florals. Um, maybe a little bit of smoky tarmac-like oud on the back end. But it's good. I mean, it's really good and would fit perfect for spring because of the fruits, the florals. Doesn't have that big, hardcore, animalic, you know, uh, oud that I love. Granted, I love. But for spring, I think this would be perfect. You'd, you'd blend right in. And you'd smell like nobody else. So, oud Yusuf um, at number, where the hell are we? Uh, 17. Number 18 is an Ensar. Sorry, it's a Sultan Pasha. But it's based on an Ensar Oud, so almost back-to-back -back Ensars, but we're switching it up here. And again, a shameless plug for the channel. Um, it's been one of those days, I guess. But um, this is Ensar Rose by Sultan Pasha. I am in love with this scent. Like, um, like I want like 12 grams of this stuff. Fuck me, man. The way that... Like... Uh, I've got a review, so you can watch you watch me ramble about this forever, but just off the cuff, the way I would describe Ensar Rose is maybe one of the most perfect white rose, like, just picturesque white rose, and um, even though there isn't Taif Rose in here, Ensar Rose smells like there's Taif Rose in here, okay? It smells like lemony, tea-like, um, leafy Taif Rose uh, with this um like one of the most i would say perfect my source sandalwood notes in a uh you know in an entire composition i think i've ever smelled and the indian oud in here just adds the tiniest i mean how he got the indian oud to play second fiddle to these rose notes I will never understand. I mean, usually Indian Oud just like takes everything over here. He did it in a way where it's the rose. It's the floral aspect of the rose. And that's why I really think you, I mean, you would smell like a prince. You'd smell like a fucking prince wearing this stuff. Um, there is some Haitian vetiver, amber, ambergris, honey, tuberose absolute, Bulgarian rose absolute, Persian rose atos, rose alba atto, that's the white rose, Tahitian vanilla, and that Indian oud is a rare Ensar oud, by the way, which um, I can tell you what, what it is if you give me one second. Um, it is Sultan Pasha Ensar Rose. Um, so it is called Oud Yunus. So we just talked about Oud Yusuf. So Oud Yunus is a very rare Hindi Oud by Ensar, distilled by Ensar that uh, Sultan Pasha uses in here. So this one, you can actually still purchase. You can get one mils for $128.78, exactly. You can get three mils for $386.34, exactly. You can get six mils for $643.90, or you can get 12 mils, which is what I want, for $1,159 and two pennies. It's like, wow. Uh, let me let me get a sip of water after that. My goodness. So, you get you get where I'm going with that. Beautiful for the spring because of the florals, though. Fuck. Um, Ensar Rose at uh, number 18. Number 19. Now we've got back-to-back Arisias to close, because we have to have Arisias to close. I'm going to go with a non-traditional one. You guys may not think this is spring wear, but I do. And the reason I do, uh, this is Chinese Oud, by the way. Came out in 21. He has since done a Chinese Oud 2, which I talked about in my Classics live stream from 2023. Um, even though it's classified as a woody, smoky fragrance, there is this orange 
aldehyde in the opening. So it's like an aldehydic sparkly orange. Um, and it's mixed with things like Chinese, because it's a Chinese oud. So if you watch my History of Chinese Oud, uh, which is a different fragrance from Chinese Oud, the History of Chinese Oud and Chinese Oud are two different fragrances, right? Um, but if you watch my The History of Chinese Oud, you know that the Chinese Oud that's used in here, in the composition, excuse me, is um, earthy, animalic, mushroomy, fungal, very challenging. One of the most challenging ouds I think I've ever smelled. But it's mixed with beautiful Mysore sandalwood. It's mixed with um, Chinese Jasmine Absolute, Chinese Gardenia CO2, Chinese Rose Otto, beautiful florals. And I think that this one, take it starts off tame enough where it, it grows a little in strength, but I think this is perfect for spring. Like, I don't think... Um, just the oud would be right to wear. Actually, the oud may not be right to wear anywhere unless you've got some serious cojones. But um, the history of Chinese oud on its own, that is that is a challenging smell. But in this perfume, the whole composition, this is, this is uh, I would have no problem wearing this. I think you'd smell like a boss. And I love this, by the way. So um, I wish I had a full bottle instead of just a little, I don't even know how much is left is the problem. But, um, okay, so that was 19. So now we go to number 20, the grand finale. And, you know, another shameless plug. That is the, uh, <laughs> that is the, um, what is it? That's the word of the day, I guess, is shameless plug. So the new Arise La Dore set, and I'm going to plug my live stream that I just did last week or a week or two ago on the new Musk's collection. And inside of said Musk's collection is a fragrance called Forbidden Flower. And we're gonna grab Forbidden Flower and I'm gonna review it off of this little bit of juice that I have here. Um, so Forbidden Flower, the reason that Forbidden Flower is being chose as the final grand finale is I believe it's still available. Um, let's go to the Arige website. Is Forbidden Flower still available? Paradise Soil. Yes, it is. Forbidden Flower is still available. And I think it's the cheapest in the collection at $250. I would actually really like a bottle of that. So, um, Forbidden Flower. Inspired by modern times when animalic ingredients are banned and natural floral materials are highly restricted, let us dive into the wicked beauty of both. Skunk oil, grapefruit, and hemp flower oil. Jasmine Sambach, Rani flower, and Indian sandalwood with a base of patchouli, cedar, benzoin, vetiver, turmeric, vanilla, ginger, uh, coriander, and Indonesian lime. And so it opens up with, uh, from memory, because I've only smelled it on that live stream I did, the first impressions live stream. It opens up with like this um, sort of like um, hemp cannabis like smell. Okay, so you get cannabis and you get a big hit of grapefruit, lots of grapefruit. Very well done grapefruit, actually. I don't, I don't dislike that grapefruit note. And the skunk oil is, it's almost like uh, it adds a little bit of buttery animalic to it. You know, skunk, skunk oil is like buttery sour because I actually have the skunk oil. He sent me some long ago, years ago, he sent me some. Um, and so some of these ingredients that are in these collections, I have in their, in their original form. Azerbaijan Rose 1972, I have some. Uh, the skunk oil, I have some. And it's a crazy smell, by the way. It's like, you know, it's like the most disgusting rotten butter you could ever imagine. But it's like this buttery, it's, it's different from civet, okay? But it blends perfectly with the hemp. And the hemp reminds me of, um, the hemp reminds me of green. And the green reminds me of spring. So, you know, you think about these uh, flowers blooming, forbidden flower. You think about the green cannabis, right? The hemp flower oil. Um, and you think about fougeres, green ferns, and stuff like that. It's not a terrible leap from a fern to a hemp plant, okay? Um, so, yes, Forbidden Flower comes in at number 20. So, and, I, and you can still buy it. So, there's a couple on here you can still buy. Uh, the Ensar Rose and Forbidden Flower. So, that is my spring list for 2024. 
I don't always do these seasonal lists, but uh, I was sick and tired of seeing all these other damn YouTubers doing it, and me not. So there we go. I did it. Um, with a lot of shameless plugs in there. I need to... Uh, where did all that come from, by the way? I'm in a advertising mood all of a sudden. But uh, I am very proud of what the channel has become. I'm proud of all of the sort of uh, interactions, the back and forth. We put up a ton of videos, ton of content. I love doing these videos for you guys. I hope you're taking something of value away from these. Hope you're learning something. Um, and as always, that's kind of my goal, to share my love and passion for perfumery with whoever's watching. So as long as I can do that and I'm enjoying myself, I'll do it forever. Um, and, and it's a joy and a pleasure and an honor. So thank you to everybody um, who watches and comments and all that stuff. If you celebrate Easter, today's Good Friday. So happy Easter to everybody. Happy Easter weekend. Uh, good, you know, have a great start to spring. And uh, you all just um, continue commenting. I love the back and forth. Uh, we're still small enough where I can answer every single comment. That won't probably won't go on forever. Or else I'll just be sitting here answering comments all day at the at the way the trajectory of the growth of the channel. But it's a it's a pleasure doing these. And for now, I like that we're small enough that I can still interact with people. So cheers, everyone! Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Bye bye.